This is Isaiah 52 and 53. Isaiah chapter 52, the final verses, verses 13, 14, and 15, begin the description of God's righteous servant that leads into, of course, chapter 53. It's the last three verses of chapter 52 and all the verses of chapter 53. Chapter 52 is a chapter of prophecy fulfilled by the return of the remnant of, the, of 13 tribes each. A remnant of each of the 13 tribes returned to Jerusalem to build God's second temple as a holy seed. As God has forgiven their sins while they make their way back. So, chapter 52 actually ends in verse 12, which reads, for you will not depart in haste, nor will you lead in flight. For the Lord is marching before you. The God of Israel is your rear guard. Now God accomplishes this by anointing a Gentile, Cyrus of Persia, who had defeated Babylon, who had defeated the Chaldeans, they went back and forth all the time. You might say Cyrus defeated Babylon and the Chaldeans, who had defeated Assyria, where the northern kingdom uh, had been uh, deported to, all that land, all the land of Babylon. The northern kingdom was defeated by the Assyrians and deported there and Assyria imported Gentiles, presumably Arabs, into the northern kingdom. Which, this is why when they return, they all go to Judah. Now many people believe that there was ten lost tribes from the town. And from, I would say, to an extent, misreading the scripture and what it, what it says or not taking it all together. Because there is a reference when Cyrus makes his declaration that he has been anointed by God to be king of all the nations of the world and he has been appointed the task by God of rebuilding God's temple in, in Jerusalem. So Cyrus issues a declaration and it is to all of God's people. It's to all 13 tribes. Any of you amongst you who want to return to Jerusalem and build this temple, you may go. Safe passage. This is how God went before the exiles of Assyria and Babylon and how he was marching in the rear. Uh, uh, in the rear. He got Cyrus to let them go for free. That's why there's no haste and no flight. They got to pack the stuff, make the trip plans, and head back to Jerusalem, which is not hard to find. I mean, you do have the Mediterranean there. <laughs> Just go along it long enough, and you're going to hit the promised land. And be Egypt, I mean. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't think there's any reason to believe they were lost. And the books of Ezra and Nehemiah make it quite certain. This is what it sound. Uh, this was one Chronicles, no Ezra chapter one verse two. Thus said King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and has charged me with building him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Any of you and all of his people, all of his people. May his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem that is in Judah and build the house of the Lord God of Israel, the God that is in Jerusalem. 
and then verse and then it picks up from there so the chiefs of the clans of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites which is the 13th tribe so you really have 13 and 10 not 12 and 10 there's three tribes right there all whose spirit has been roused by God they got ready to go up to build the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem And this is what Ezra has to say in chapter 3, verse 1. And this has to do with the returning of the exiles. When the seventh month arrived, the Israelites, being settled in their towns in Judah, the entire people assembled as one man in Jerusalem. When the people of Israel gather as one man, it is all twelve tribes and the priestly tribe of the Levites as Israel, which is how some people interpret Isaiah 53, to be the people of Israel by the name Israel when they gather as one man. In 1 Chronicles chapter 9 verses 2 and 3. The first to settle in their towns, again the exiles, on their property that they took when they got back. Nobody had been there during the exile. Were Israelites, priests, Levites, and temple servants, while some of the Judaites and some of the Benjamites and some of the Ephraimites and Manessahites. There's two more tribes. Where are these lost tribes? Everybody comes back. God's prophecy was, I'm pulling them all back. In the four corners of the earth, which would have been the Middle East in that day and time, as far as anybody knew. So we know Benjamites came back, Judahites, Levites, Manessahites, Ephraim, and which, by the way, Manasseh, Ephraim, and Judah were the largest landholders. Those are the names you're going to mention. And of course, you will mention the priestly tribe, the Levites. And not necessarily the smaller lot owners of the great partition by Moses and Joshua in the Promised Land. Verses 13 through 15 are combined multiple verses by quotes, except most renditions of the translation of the Hebrew to English don't have the quotes. The Jewish Publication Society, to decide to start from scratch in 1956 or 7, and just get the original Leningrad Codex, the oldest Hebrew text that we have on the Hebrew Bible, and they started from scratch. It's the best rendition you can find. A lot of it because of the knowledge in the world in 1957 versus lots of renditions that are used from back in the town in days. Shabbat.org. They use a version that has the commentary of Rashi, does not have the quotes. And it is important. It shows the demarcation between verse 12 and 13, 14, and 15 describing the righteous servant in Isaiah 53, 10, and 11. That also goes for Art Scroll, a great publisher of Jewish works that's uh, uh, aimed at the orthodox of Judaism. They don't have the quotes either. And interesting enough, after those three multiple verses, six more appear. The first six verses of Isaiah 53 are put together by quotes. Verse 1 starts with a quote. Verse 6 ends with the quote. And that's important. Many people interpret these witnesses of verse 1 of chapter 53 as being the kings of nations that were startled. 
David is in Isaiah 13, 14, 15. But it's not. It's the people who were ma are made righteous by the righteous servant. They're the ones. Who can believe what we have heard? Who can believe our report? It is them. They have recognized this man that God describes. They've recognized him by the verses, by the description. Every verse descriptive. And there's, they're, they're trying to basically spread the word. He is here. The righteous servant of God. Which means, of course, God's here. God's got to gotta tell him, you know, who he is and teach him and, and tell him, uh, I am the one that gave you cancer. I chose to. And it exposed you to death. That's in verse 12. But I give you long life. But I give you long life. Supposed to die. Even in the, the Christian version, they say God brought this righteous servant to to grief with illness. Well, if you, illness is not the right word. It's disease. But be that as it may, you don't fall to grief if you've got the common cold or the flu. When he says sickness, he means a sickness that exposes you to death. Today, of course, we think of cancer first. Verse 2, and this is very interesting because it, it combines really with those in chapter 52. For he is grown by his favor, like a tree crown, like a tree trunk out of arid ground. He had no form or beauty that we should look at him, no charm that we should find him pleasing. In 50, chapter 52, they talk about uh, his image was such uh, that you could not even recognize him as human. But here's the best description of it. He comes from a Christian country. That's the air ground. And you say, well, wait a minute. How can you possibly know he comes from a, a Christian country? Because of Isaiah 63, God says, or it's first written, Who is this coming from Adam with blood spattering his clothes, etc., etc.? There's a lot to Isaiah 63. And God says, It is I, and I come in victory. Adam in the town, and God knew the Jewish people were going to do this. He knew the time it was going to be made by the way he wrote the Torah, leaving so much information out on his commandments. In the Talmud, the Saul, the eternal enemy of his brother Jacob, is associated with Adam, who became associated with Rome. Then Rome Christianity, Rome fell, and today a reference to Adam is to Christianity. And God knew that, why else would he have a verse written that that's where he's coming from? And when? Malachi 3. I'm going, to, I'm sending my messenger, and I shall return to my temple suddenly. And the messenger is to clear the way and deliver the new covenant of Jeremiah 31. Now, his name's Elijah, and that's interesting, because Elijah is the messenger of Malachi 3. I want to get back to the man described as a Gentile in just a moment, because it says, who's this coming from the dom? And God says, of the peoples, none were with me. There's no Jews with him. That's the peoples he's talking about. And there's, as I said, there's a lot more than this, but I'm just going to keep it right there dealing with chapter 52 in the first six verses of chapter 53. In Malachi 3, God sends Elijah back, but he's the only man to be taken to heaven in the Hebrew Bible, specifically. Specifically takes him, the chariots of God, take him up 
in a whirlwind and his body disappears and then he sends him back what do you ask the man who says he's Elijah tell us about heaven tell us every mystery of heaven there is that's a proof that there's a better one and I'll get to that because you wouldn't necessarily believe what he said it's why that it is helpful and that's and he's the man to select also for this reason. God also says in verse 1, the angel of the covenant that you desire is already on the way. Well, if Elijah is the messenger and he's from heaven, then he's got to know the angel and they can converse. Turns out that's the angel of God's presence, I believe. Angel of God's presence. Wherever God's presence is, which is his mind, it's where he feels he is. It was, it's what of God, the consciousness of the universe, enters into the temple. And he has his spirit around him. So you have, you have this, this Holy Spirit, that wherever God's presence is, the Holy Spirit is. And wherever his presence is, the angel is. I believe. That God created an angel. And as its body, physical form that we cannot see from the unseen realm of God, is the spirit of God itself. It's not the likeness of the human being with wings. And God puts this in Isaiah 63. That's why I'm bringing it up. And also, of course, why you pick Elijah. He can talk to the angel. The angel delivers the message. Elijah delivers it to the world. And God comes in the time of the end, of course. <clears throat> There's just too many people to do it differently. I mean, I often wonder, how did everybody hear Moses from the mountain? There's a million people and no microphones. <laughs> Pass it back, I guess. So, in two, we have a Gentile. Now, why did God do that? Now, he used Cyrus of Persia. He used Cyrus of Persia, a Gentile, to set the exiles free when God forgave their sins. And the message that Elijah's going to have is the new covenant is here, everybody's forgiven. Starts, everything starts going hand in hand after a while. Jesus was a Jew. And if you think God didn't know that was going to happen with the Gentiles, then you don't understand why he chose to crush the man with disease. See, he's blemished. God knew what the Gentiles were going to do. So he's going to bring... Now, of course, the Christians are going to say, well, we don't care what Judaism says in the town. They say Adon is, is Christianity. You know, they're not going to listen to you. For the Jewish people, you got to see magnificence when it happens to you with what God is doing. Because he says, when I come back, those who told you to get down on the ground and walk all over you, he says in chapter 51, he's going to pass his wrath to them from the Jews. That's chapter 51. That's just a couple short of 52 and 3. It's not short, actually. He's coming with vengeance against them. He plans, in my opinion, based on what I'm saying, to take out the cornerstones of the churches and the cornerstones of the Vatican and let it start to all fall away. Over time, of course. So the early grounds from this chapter 53, verse 2, is a Christian country and the man's of a Gentile. Now, you can imagine what the Jewish people are going to think about a Gentile being the anointed one, Moshe, the sin of David. It's not going to go over well at all. And that's why it says he had no former beauty. We can't even look at a Gentile. Just, <laughs> just keep your distance. We don't believe a word you're saying, you're a liar. And they shunned and despised him. Held him of no account. That's the next verse. But clearly he gets it all taken care of and makes his way because he ends up making the many righteous of the Jewish people. Isaiah 11 says he has an abode to be honored. He's buried in a rich man's grave. 
So it's all going to work out for me. He's just got to get to Israel, convert Orthodox, and become an Israeli citizen, and make sure everybody realizes wherever he goes, God goes. Just like Moses. If you went and found Moses, you figured God's real close by. It's the same with this man. Prophet like Moses, it's Elijah, descendant of David, and we have one description. God sends four men, and he gives one description. This righteous servant is going to have the capabilities, the attributes, of whatever it takes to do whatever Elijah can do, whatever the prophet like Moses can do, whatever the descendant of David can do. And he calls them, my servant David, a shepherd. He's not a king. There is no kingdom to be gathered. God knew Israel was going to be a democratic country. He knows everything from beginning to end. That's how you can see how all... You know, you've got three different books. you got Isaiah describing the righteous servant. You have Jeremiah giving you a new covenant that he ends up delivering. Because his purpose is the same as Elijah. Believe it or not, Elijah recounts the father to the son and the son to the father by drawing them back to Judaism, which means to righteousness with the new amendment to the first covenant, be mindful of the, of the teachings I gave Moses of the laws and rules and commandments for all of his family. He's making the many righteous and his purpose might prosper. God says, if he doesn't get it done, I'm gonna come with an utter destruction. Basically that means Elijah's gotta be recognized for who he is, the righteous servant. And he's got to draw people to him because no one can have that temple built by themselves. And that's what God's saying. If you don't build it, the day is going to come that that land is going to be utterly destroyed. He doesn't mean he's going to do it in his power any more than he raised up the Babylonians or the Assyrians or Rome as armies because the Jews wouldn't stop sinning. Lift the sword against you, pestilence. Now, all those things were happening. God just took credit for it. To put fear into the Jewish people. To make them fear him, heed him, listen to him. Which means his prophets and, you know, they, even, they laughed at Ezekiel. They laughed at Ezekiel, which is interesting. It's Ezekiel. That is the key to Isaiah 53. The very same thing. A spirit of God alights upon him. That's Isaiah one of chapter eleven, one and two. A spirit shall light upon him. It's a little bit different with Ezekiel. He said God was telling him to get up on his feet. He says, At that moment a spirit entered into me. And I could hear God's words. Now this is actually, I've got well over five documentations in the scripture for what I'm about to say. But it's a whole other video. God is in his spirit. This whole, his way of communicating, and it falls true for all the prophets, for Moses. And there's back up for it. He tells the, I'll give you one, he tells the Israelites. I'm sending my angel before you. Do not disobey him. He will not forgive you. For my name, Hashem, is in him. What does that mean? Moses, walking along, he notices a burning bush. And that doesn't burn up. He stops. The angel of the Lord is in the burning bush. Now, he can't. you can't see the angel of the Lord. You can't, you can't see spirit, and that's his body. You can't see it. And then God speaks to him. Guess what? God is in his spirit. He's in that angel. I have a lot on that, by the way. So, Ezekiel. So what happens? How do I see this man, 53? Well, right off the bat, 
in chapter 53, you have a verse that says this man is taken from, from the land of the living. Okay, but this man gets long line. He's, he's exposed to it. But that doesn't, he's cut off from the land of the living, if I said that wrong. Yeah, he's cut off from. That just means you can't get to it. You can't have it. God tells Ezekiel, go to your house. I'm putting the cords of my power around you, and you shall not go out amongst the people. He just took him from society. Why? To change his nature. Ezekiel says, that spirit entered into me. The spirit seized me. I went in bitterness and in fury of my spirit in the hand of God. What does that mean? Are you all mad and furious because God's got you? What happened? <laughs> it's the words of Isaiah. Punishment, chastisement, maltreatment, crushing and bruising. It's like taming a wild horse. If you've ever seen from Texas, if you ever see that, they put that horse through hell. They beat on it, they pull it, they yank it to the ground, over and over until finally the horse just stands there and says, okay, get on. I can't, I can't take this anymore. I'm fine. You know, Moses, who I can assure you went through this process that Ezekiel goes through, which the next thing that happens is he's, he's, he's pinned to the ground. God says, you'll stay here on the ground. And I'm putting the cords on your side, facing Jerusalem, and I'm going to put the cords of my power around your wrist behind your back. He binds his arms behind his back for over a year. I think it's 390 days on one side, and then for 40 days he gets to flip over on the other side. One for the sins. Notice it's, it's called the punishment of, but what do you think the punishment is for? It's for the sins of the house of Judah and the sins of the house of Israel. You see the same words popping up in chapter 53. And all that's really being talked about is God's fire of refinement, like taking a cadet in the army and making him into a Navy SEAL, a Green Beret. It's just making him right. Now Moses, you know, was, you know, he had a furious spirit too. He killed a man. He got so angry. And he was fighting. But at the end of his life, the scripture says, Moses was the most humble man on earth. Now, I know he did a lot of things, but none of which would really humble you. If anything, you're going to get real full of yourself, leading a million people to a new land, and God is with you the whole time. But uh, now became the most humble. You know who he was? He's that horse. He's that horse. You said, okay. So, look, I wrote your books for you. And he comes in after a long day, gets in the tent, and God says, Moses, get your stylus and some parchment. We got 